Hey, thank you all for coming out on this uh, this stormy night. And uh, it, it's uh, always something to be out here in, in the storm. It, it's uh, a different place. We we had a meeting in Chelsea at, at three o'clock, and even that four or five miles to come out here, uh, it was like you were in a different world. With the wind howling and the rain driving sideways. So uh, before I begin, I'd like to just recognize you know a couple of folks. Obviously, our Chief Flanagan, who sits on our board of directors, is here. Police Chief Delahanty is here. I thank you, Chief, for coming and, and for all your work to, to help us. Uh, we do have several councilors here. Councilor Bonacori is here, Barone, and Councilor Del Vento is here, um, representing this board. And uh, I also should point out that, that um, we, uh, we, I got a call first in this morning, speaking to Leo, um, to discuss what was going on and get an update to make sure that um, we were still with the program. And uh, I can assure you that we are. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't also just do a little shout out to a couple of other folks who have played a, quite a role around here over the years. One's Tom Riley's here, and Peg Riley, the former member of our board, is here. And I'd also like to thank Kathy Capuccio for her work in helping coordinate and setting up the dates and, and making sure everyone knew that we're having this meeting. And, and I, it's, it's my hope and our hope that this becomes a regular seasonal meeting. And, and when we met at the, the school and at the, the council uh, meeting before that, I had stated that I would like to get into the, 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 the pattern of having regular citizens meetings, similar to what we have uh, down at Nut Island. Our, we have a, a big facility, not nearly as big as this, obviously, but down on the peninsula of Quincy on Howe's Neck. And uh, uh, we meet quarterly, not quarterly, but we meet in the spring and the fall to go over updates, what's going on there, what are the issues, what are the neighborhood concerns. And what I'd like to do is, is you know, have this on a regular basis. And then everyone's welcome to come down and talk. We'll give you updates on what's going on. And, and uh, uh, you know, get in the pattern of having better relations with, with you as our neighbors. Um, the, we have a number of items, obviously the, the um, the floor is going to be open and it's going to be a full discussion. We'll stay here as long as it takes. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see, uh, Councillor Keller is here. I didn't see a friend, Councillor, I apologize. Thanks for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Um, you know, obviously, I think what, what probably is, is the, the follow up to the last meeting is what's going on with co digestion and, and the issue of the pilot project. And we'll work very hard at that. Uh, we made a commitment at, at Speaker Leo's uh, urging and, and to you as the members of the audience that we would look at alternatives uh, to the trucking and we would not proceed uh, with, with the trucking. And we would remain in that position today. It's our commitment. And I told Speaker Leo this this morning that we are pursuing other alternatives that look positive, barging, um, and that we would not proceed if we had to fall back to the trucking. I think that's what we made to you and to him and, and the councilors, the elected officials who are here, and Chief Flanagan has held us to it as well at the board meeting. So uh, I know that that's probably one of the major issues. And what I would like to do is, is if, if you know, agree with everyone, have Dave West, who's the superintendent out here, uh, take a, kind of give you an update of, of where we are. Um, on the, the co-digestion program and where it goes from here. And I think you'll find that we've been very, very responsive to your concerns. Dave, can we introduce ourselves? Or is <coughs> Hi, my name is John Bateri. I am the Deputy Chief Operating Officer with the NWRA. I used to be on Deer Island many, many, many years. Can you hear? Can you hear? All right, we'll yell. Yeah, stand up. Get Hi, my name is John Materi, and I am the Deputy Chief Operating Officer, and I was on Deer Island as the Director for many, many years, and I think I've seen all of the wonderful folks here at one time or another, so thank you for having me. Dave DeWest, Deer Island Director, current. I'm Mike Plumberg, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the MWA. We have Connery, I'm the Communications Director. And Lenny Cawley's here as well, he's the Community Coordinator, he's the, out okay. here, Quite a bit. So, well, Dave, why don't you give a, uh, an update on the, the code digestion? And actually, Stan, uh, probably here project out better 
this way. Uh, essentially, what we want to do is kind of give you an update on where the Cook Digestion Program is and also energy use on Deer Island. Uh, we also have a, a proposal for a fishing pier that we're going to talk about. Uh, and then uh, updates on other Deer Island projects. We're going to obviously talk about uh, an issue that's for, uh, first and foremost uh, with the community, which is truck traffic, uh, and then maybe talk a little bit about security as well. So co-digestion. Most important thing is we are still pursuing the program, but we've made the commitment that trucking is not an option. You will not see a truck of food waste come through your community. If it doesn't work out, As Fred mentioned, we are not going to be pursuing COVID. The state is aware of it, and uh, we've, you know, we've made that commitment to our board as well, and to all of our surrounding communities. Obviously, you're the most uh, important people uh, that are impacted by that. So, but essentially, the program uh, is very similar to what I presented uh, during the last town meeting, in that we are, uh, except with one big difference, no trucking. So we are evaluating what uh, barging uh, options there are for Deer Island. We're talking with our current contractor, which is Waste Management, that was supposed to pro uh, provide pre-processed, source-separated organics. Uh, the uh, pilot operation is a one to three year pilot. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of technical information on here, but essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna receive material uh, in a similar fashion to what we planned originally, anywhere from seven dry tons a day all the way up to 28 dry tons per day over the course of year one of the pilot and then continue with 28 dry tons per day. All of that's gonna be received and shipped by barge. Uh, the quantities are very low for barging, so what that means is that we're only gonna see one barge land at our pier every single week, at most. One of the, one of the misconceptions I'll jump in, Dave, and, and I just want to, you'll see this as, as Dave's talks. Someone said, well, how much garbage are you going to bring here? And what's it going to do for birds and smells and rodents with all this garbage coming to the island? It's not, it's not garbage. It's going to be a processing center at another location. Right now, that location appears to be in Charlestown, in which the trash trucks will bring the food waste to this processing facility in Charlestown. It'll be turned into a slurry, not, but very similar to a coffee culotta. Mostly liquid. Not that you don't drink it. No, no, no. <laughs> no, but it, it'll, it'll, be a, it'll be in liquid form. It'll then be put in a sealed barge. The sealed barge will make its way to our pier. It'll have a pump on the barge. It'll then hook up to a pipe, which Dave will describe here in a minute, that will travel underground and be put in a storage area, closed storage area. It'll then be fed into the digesters, again, closed. And the result of that will be it's a digest, is a lot more methane and an increase in the sludge that will become pellets down in Quincy. So again, I just wanted to, I know maybe we didn't make that clear at the last time, there won't be garbage coming to the island. There won't be anything that's open that would cause any odors. There won't be any way for it to impact any rodents. It'll all be sealed within pipes uh, and within containment structures. So why don't you talk about how we're gonna get it from the pier up in. Okay, so uh, the plans as it exists right now uh, is that we're going to land a barge in this area. We actually did, uh, at the last meeting, I talked about that there might be some significant uh, expenses associated with uh, repairing the pier since it hasn't been in operation. The good news is, is that it only needs about $20,000 worth of repairs, and that's only to a couple of the, pipe, uh, the pilots that are in there. Uh, they, uh, there is a little bit of soil deposition in the area where the barge would land, uh, but not, it will not impact uh, the, the depth of the barge as it lands. So, uh, so that's not going to be a problem. We don't have to dredge. We don't have any of those additional expenses that we were concerned about when we uh, talked about that as a uh, potential problem. Uh, so what we plan on doing is uh, creating an offload connection at this point. The barge will connect up to a pipe. It will immediately go underground and then travel across the entire facility into the building at this point and then go into the building and then get stored. All the material would actually get pumped and stored at this facility right here. 
That's a covered facility that is under odor control, never sees the light of day. So from there, they'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a pumping operation that will feed it into these two uh, test digesters. We operate typically eight digesters out of the 12 at any one time. Uh, and uh, we're going to slowly increase the feeds over a period of months and the first year. Uh, to find in, uh, really in a controlled fashion because we want to evaluate how much digester gas actually gets produced, how much energy can we get, uh, can we produce from that gas, and is it worth it to go through all of this? So, and any other expenses that might actually occur because of this operation. The, uh, the most important thing uh, that uh, on the pre-processing side with waste management, who is the current contractor that's, uh, that we've hooked up with, uh, is that it's no cost to us. We're not, be, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not paying them anything to do what they need to do. They are going out, they're collecting the material uh, from uh, commercial industrial institutions. They're paying for, uh, for a facility that they're siting and they're building on their own. Uh, and then they're paying uh, an additional two and a half million dollars uh, just to switch over to this barging operation. We wanted to avoid that barging operation at the beginning, but obviously your concerns were very loud and very, uh, very straightforward. Very clear. So, very clear. So, uh, so, uh, so the costs that uh, are actually incurred are really, on the waste management side, they're talking about two and a half million dollars to get a barge, uh, put it into operation, modify that barge, and, and start the operation. That's before one, uh, the first gallon actually gets delivered to us. Uh, on our side, we have to build a pipeline uh, and then modify facilities and then build in a feed-in station uh, to bring it to the digesters. So a little bit more upfront expense, but again, if it, uh, if it makes sure that we, we minimize any impact of the town of Winthrop, that's what we want to do, and it is the right thing to do. And we, this is, there is going to be the need, if the pilot works, there's going to be a need for two storage tanks? Yeah, uh, yeah, in the long run, if we do scale up to a permanent program, we're going to keep the pipeline with the receiving station uh, at the pier. Uh, we're going to add two additional tanks right here, and, and those will be covered under ODA control with additional uh, uh, operating units. Most of it will be contained within a building, but the, the tanks will be covered and under full ODA control. And then there'll be a feed-in station that will be, be built right next to it and then sent to all the digesters, all 12 digesters. So that's the long run of, uh, of the operation. Is there any chance that that pipe could clog and that stuff could back up? Uh, it's a 10-inch pipe, it's, which is fairly large. Uh, the, the consistency of the material, we've actually specified exactly what sort of consistency we want this material. It's, uh, it's, and it's actually, uh, this exact pre-processing operation is being conducted in LA and has been in operation for about 10 months now. Uh, New York uh, at uh, the Newtown uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant in, uh, just outside of New York City is actually uh, using the exact same operation. So this is not something new. It's something that has been proven. So it's just finally coming to the Boston area. And we will, I'm sorry, but we will also put in two plants. So we have one if it does get plugged go to the other and we'll have flushing connections that can flush the material through so it doesn't get backed up, it doesn't turn foul. Right. And I also <coughs> you know that we've had a Coast Guard review and, and they have determined that this material is not a ha considered a hazardous material or a, or a petroleum material. So that's a very positive development but it, you know, and, and you know, we'll have the redundancy, and frankly, if, if something did get clogged, we'd, we'd have no way to go. We'd shut off and we'd put it up the other pipe. Good question. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. You may not have talked well, about adding all these digesters if needed. No. No, no, no. no. Just the two, uh, but in the future. Yeah, yeah we're, uh, the initial study will be to pilot with two digesters <coughs> out of the eight working digesters. Out of, we typically yeah. operate eight yes. out of 12. So uh, we're going to de designate two that we're going to put in this additional material and then measure the effects of it. So, and that's really good, just a, it's kind of like a test and a control. All right, right. so there won't be an expansion on it, because I'm thinking with all the sewage that if you expand the MWRA region, if a, a town or anything comes in. But I mean, if we need more for sewage, 
we're not giving away digestive. No, no. If anything, if we ever uh, had an issue where sewerage increased to the point where it would take up more space in the digesters, like I mentioned, we only operate eight out of the 12. Even for this pilot, and in the long term, if we uh, go to a full-scale operation, we're still going to operate eight. We'll have four in reserve at all times. Yeah, so. we're basically going to be bleeding this slurry into the current digesters. So it won't be a standalone with just food waste in it. The test shows it needs to blend in with the, the sewer, the, the, with the sludge. <coughs> and, and so we'll be just bleeding it in at a modest pace. So, and right now, about two thirds of the material actually get destroyed. And that gets converted to a digester gas, and that's, the, that's what we use to power our uh, boilers and create electricity on the island. Uh, and, uh, and this is an opportunity to increase that material from mm -hmm. digester gas to, uh, to help offset our operating costs. I didn't realize it was being blended in. Yeah, it's being blended in. Yeah. You made mention earlier in your presentation something about pellets and yeah. down to Quincy. Is yeah. that coming from this process? It, it, it's occurring right now since the plant has been in full operation. The sludge that's left, when, when that's all the stuff's put in the digesters, two things come up. One is methane gas, which is great energy for us, and the other is the sludge that is pumped underneath the harbor back through the tunnel to the pellet plant in Quincy where it is dried and made into pellets that's used for fertilizer. So it's not involving any trucking or any no. movement? No. It's no. underground. No, that, that's a seven mile made. pipeline between us and our uh, Quincy facility. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> um, I have two questions. One, um, since it's a blended material, is there going to be any different chemical brought in to disinfect this material versus what is already used on the island for the sewage? No, because uh, we, we don't actually have to disinfect this material. We actually want to uh, use the, uh, actually, uh, food, uh, food material does not have a whole lot of extra bacteria, uh, but the sewage sludge does. And we cultivate that the good bacteria to actually do the work in the digesters that break it down to, to uh, you know the digester gas and then innocuous uh, material later on that we convert to a fertilizer pellet. So uh, with this food waste, it's it's really highly uh, digestible material. You know, you, everybody eats food. <laughs> Most of it goes through you. Uh, it, it converts to energy. It's the same exact process. With digestion, we, uh, our digesters operate at coincidentally 98 degrees Fahrenheit, just like your body. So, and we're trying to cultivate the bacteria that are normally in your body to do the work to break the material down. The good thing is, is that with uh, with wastewater sludges, we only really see about 60 percent of the material uh, broken down in that process. But with food waste. 85 to 90 percent of that material is broken down. So there's a lot less remaining sludge from it. Most of it gets converted to a digester gas. And so, it breaks down very quickly. And it breaks down very, very quickly. And it has to meet the same requirements as our municipal wastewater coming in. We have a sewer ordinance which, which states the quality of what comes in. And we're requiring this vendor to have manifests of where they pick everything up and where they bring it to it. And they have to test. Uh, uh, loads that come into us as well. Yeah, they have to meet the uh, our sewer use ordinances. They're not bringing it in by sewer, they're bringing it in by barge, but uh, they're required to test it just as if it was coming into our sewers. They have to test for heavy metals, organics, and all the other things. They have to meet all of our industrial uh, permit limit requirements that we currently have. They also have to meet, uh, we have regulations on uh, the quality of the material in our fertilizer pellet. So they have to meet those requirements as well, which are a lot more stringent. So, uh, so that's a good thing because we want to make sure that we uh, we we had discussions on uh, in the last uh, meeting about making sure we don't upset the process. It's really not. Uh, we're not expecting the digesters to go belly up or anything. I'm part of the pun, uh, but really, what uh, we have a very marketable product in uh, this fertilizer pellet that gets generated. And we don't want anything to, uh, to go wrong with that. We don't want plastic material that might get in there that might uh, affect uh, the quality of that material that does get land applied as a fertilizer. It's a very valuable product. It's got a great name out in the industry. Uh, and people are 
coming at us to, to grab this stuff all over the, uh, the eastern seaboard. So uh, it's a very marketable product, and we want to make sure that that's not impacted by any change in the operation. Do I have any questions? Yeah, no, I think I actually have two more, actually. So, um, just because I don't know how many people in um, residents saw the town council meeting last night, that all the methane gas that you'll be producing, you're going to be burning off as you're producing it and not storing it on the island. Correct. Yeah, we, we will use that. it as we generate it. Using it as you're generating it. And, and um, we use it beneficially. That's the most important thing. We, we will not be flaring this. And you it. have no plans whatsoever to have a storage tank built for it at no. the same time? No. Um, and what's your profit margin going to be for this, for the, for the uh, pilot program? It's not, it's not really a profit margin, it's actually a savings to the operation because the extra energy that we're going to be producing is really reducing the amount of purchase power that we have to go out and buy from the grid. Well, that's not what was said in the meeting last night. Yeah, I'll follow up on that. Uh, just based, hi Kathy Cuccio, um, just based on MWA's own documents themselves, it states that, um, because I don't have it right in front of me. Oh, okay, it's right here. Um, it states that the updated feasibility cost benefit models predict 2.3 million in net annual savings with a potential 2.7 million additional non rate revenue assessed for tipping fees, so a benefit of 5 million. Because that was actually one of my questions as well. So, um, again, from what I've read, um, there's a lot of very positive. Um, impacts, if you will, mm -hmm. from co-digestion because of renewable energy. Um, but going to Dawn's point is, when it says five million, you know, in saving on opex, if you will, with um, so where is when 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 again it's stated in here and it could be erroneous. Where is the revenue then coming from? I, I assume what will happen. I could be wrong, just based on what I've read in other it happens in the UK and in other states is that whomever picks up the um, food waste is they charge a tipping fee to the person that they're taking it from. So I guess we're, we're, we're I'm just, we're curious is where does the, where does your revenue come from? Are you sharing in waste management's <coughs> tipping fees? Where, where does the revenue come from? Because I think during the pilot, we won't be doing any tipping fees. So I think that we're, we're basically talking about the same thing, but we're, I guess we're not clarifying. During the, during the pilot program, we're not going to look at tipping fees. So the savings that would occur during the pilot would simply be the savings from using, having to buy less electricity. That's where the savings would come in, or, or from the heat that we use the methane for. The long range plan as we get towards the end of the pilot will be to look at, okay, do we need to, to put a tipping fee in? Can we put a tipping fee in? And, and how would that all work? So that's a question that comes, in a sense, down the road, the tipping fee question. Um, so again, the, the goal here, and, and the, we'll get another project that we'd like to, to talk about uh, improving the way we make energy. Our goal, the main goal, is one, to, we're going to have to have capital expenses to get those defrayed. There's going to be operational expenses to get those defrayed. And then make as much electricity and energy here as we possibly can to get off the roller coaster of the energy markets. And we have the potential, if this all works, along with the change in the way we, we make power here, um, to get up over 90% energy uh, independence, which you know, I sure would like to have in my house. But I mean, that's the goal, and that helps the rate payers. It, it helps everybody. And it, you know, it, it's a very positive thing. So there, there's two phases. The first is the pilot, no tipping fees. We're just going to see if it works, what it makes, how it does, what savings we have. When we get to the down the road on that, we then look at okay, what are our real costs? What are our capital costs? Do we need a tipping fee? What's the vendor's tipping fee? And that will bring in some revenue that will help us defray the costs of building this thing and maintaining this thing in the plant. And you can look at the tipping fees that we're planning on charging potentially in the future once the program becomes permanent. Uh, as the equivalent of uh, a waste hauler would charge to pick up the material and then process it, then they in turn have to pay a landfill to dispose of that material, 
and C has got the exact same equivalent. So we step in in place of being the landfill, we are now the final end, uh, end of that process, in which case, but in our particular case, we're actually turning it into a biofuel. So during this three year, again, potential three year Correct. programs, I know you guys are looking into, the vote didn't happen last week, you're looking into amending the waste management agreement in a couple of different ways. Um, so in, during the pilot program, waste management, excuse me, waste management will actually not be receiving any tipping, tipping fees? Is that what you're saying? No, waste management will be charging their own tipping fee because they still have to pick up the material and charge oh, okay. them. So they'll, they'll be charging a, com a commercial industrial institution just like they currently do. Sure. Yeah, okay. So what your um, thought is, is if this goes to a permanent plan, which it, it appears that, you know, based on it must be your research, you think it would happen to be because on the vote that was supposed to take place last Wednesday by the board of directors, there was an initiation, if you will, if the board agreed on it, to actually go forward with the permanent design of the facility. So I think that based on your research, if you were, were betting gentlemen and women, this is gonna go forward. So it's at that, but let's just say that if this does become a permanent facility, as I think you think it's going to happen, so the um, the MWRA would be make, would be again making money, if you will, for lack of saying it a better way, off of tipping fee. So waste management would charge a tipping fee, and then the MWRA would also charge a tipping fee to awesome. who you're taking potentially. <coughs> yeah, we have some hurdles with that. Okay, just yeah, 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 just, yeah. Okay, just if I could, because there's a bunch of folks behind you keep putting their hands up for questions, oh, of course, so yes, maybe yes. we can rotate it around a little bit. But one of the things that we're trying to do is maximize the dollars. So there's a little bit of a, uh, anytime you do a pilot or an experiment, there's a risk. And what we're trying to do, if we're going to invest money for the pilot, we want to spend as much of that money in a way that if it becomes permanent, we don't have to rebuild everything. So <coughs> rather than building a temporary storage facility here, we're going to build pipelines that could be used if this thing goes full bore. So we're not throwing away the money that we used for the temporary experiment. So anyway, I saw another thank council. Can that Council Mal come in? Great. Council, thank you for coming down tonight. Um, I'm trying David, to see David. David, uh, David, David we'll just rotate around. Is that wrong? Uh, David Osborne. Uh, first of all, Mr. Lasky, <coughs> to first give my a compliment out. I mean, your staff is the most responsive staff I've ever seen in my life for a public facility. By none, and, and, uh, and that's the end of my compliments. And to read, read, <laughs> <laughs> read, read is wonderful. <laughs> that's it. I'll take where I can get it. <laughs> the first thing, I'm I, I just going to take a question with my notes here. Uh, the permit that you have, uh, it's a very, very clearly defined and limited permit. It's one of the most comprehensive ones ever put together by the EPA. There's limitations on discharge into the harbor. And there's also, uh, it's not the built, the digesters weren't built uh, to, tr to treat organic food material. Uh, yeah, only wastewater. So now I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, does, how, do you, how do you go to do that, allow, allow to do this in a, with a permit process that limits you on uh, key, key conditions of, of effluent limits on uh, suspended solids, speaking <coughs> coliform, phosphorus, chlorine, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, how all of a sudden do you get the approval to do this when getting a permit to do this, and not only that, but that your, per your, your permit allows you to work only with MWRA communities. But I don't know if now we're dealing with communities that are outside of the MWRA. No, I think, well, let me start in. We have to meet every permit that we currently have. We're not modifying any permit, whether it be the permit you described, whatever it is, we have to meet the current requirements placed on us by EPA and DEP. So we have to, within those those parameters, make this work. And we, we're confident we can make it work. We went, spent several hours with EPA, a whole host of people uh, from EPA the other day going over all the details in this thing. So you can be assured, the folks in Winthrop and around the harbor can be assured, that we have to maintain the same high standard with this program as we do now. <coughs> it's just a requirement. Could I follow up on that for a second? Sure. Um, Peg Riley, um, with the president. I was on the first board of directors of the authority. Um, I almost jumped out of my seat because when you started talking about 
temporary and then going to permanent facilities. There are those of us that were here 30 years ago, and you know better than most um, how much noise we made and how successful we really were. I don't think people realize to date that um, at that time, the design was not only to build one of the largest service treatment plants in the country, and maybe even in the world, but also to burn the sludge and incinerate us. We were also going to leave then the Deer Island House of Correction on the site. It was because of the citizens of the town, and then with the cooperation of the elected officials, that we were able to refine this whole treatment plan. My terrible concern is, and I have a prepared statement, I'm not going to bore everybody with it because it gets political and I'm, I think this is all too important. When we had the original studies with the, the large treatment plant, we had permits, we were 10 years going back over the process because we did not follow all the environmental rules that were available. So it was 10 years before this plant could even be built because we didn't do it right the first time. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll hand you in my questions because it's too long. Um, there are some that don't think that these are important questions. Um, um, I know it's important because I lived it. You know, I, this isn't my first rodeo. Um, I am terribly concerned that you are going to vote on a pilot program, a pilot program in connection with a permanent program as an oxymoron. You just kind of you can't say that. You can't say it if you um, execute a memorandum of understanding with the town saying that when and if you go to a permanent facility that we need to know about it, we need to make sure that our public officials tell us about it, that we don't have trucking that we were unaware of. We need for you to think, just back up a little bit. I personally hope Paul doesn't vote in favor of this until all of the questions that the people here have, all of the questions I have, have been answered. My biggest one is we were the environmental reviews. We had to do Fonzies for, for nothing. Those are findings of no significant impact. I don't see a study, the speaker asked for studies. I don't think there think are any studies. Mm -hmm. Kathleen has had to go to, for the freedom of information to try to get information on what has transpired. Not blaming you, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, moving forward, we need to do more environmental review. Has the authority in some way been exempt from all of these horrific environmental studies that, um, that they're doing? The people in Revere right now, it's just a little side issue that we're in that terrible tornado. Mm -hmm. Do you know there's a woman there that wants to tear down her garage and she can't tear down her garage because the Environmental Protection Agency came in and told her that she has to do a comprehensive study with rodents in order to um, have her garage torn down. <laughs> Yet you, and I'm not blaming you, you come here, thank, thank you for coming because you've had to take a lot of questions. We don't have any documentation. I want to see documentation that this authority moving forward, we'll make sure that there is proper environmental review during the pilot program so that before we ever intend on expanding to a long-range permanent program, which by the way, could end up as one of the largest methane producers in the state, if not the New England area, or better. We have 80, 87 percent, 86 percent, um, you know, capacity. So there's a lot of questions. Like I said, I won't bore you. My concern is, for instance, the environmental review. I would like to see more. Why, why there wasn't any done up to this point is maybe because there, these other facilities haven't been online long enough for you to get feedback and information from them. So we're going to do it right. We should make sure that we have environmental review with all of the questions answered. Go into your pilot program because that's how you have to do it in order to get the process started. Um, but to just say that we're going to go from a pilot to a, uh, a permanent facility, is, I don't think is, is proper. And I would hope that my representative doesn't vote in favor of this until such time as there is a memorandum of understanding with the town on other issues that I have, I have now addressed uh, in my letter to you. Um, what happens if the barge goes down? What if the marine forecast is such that you can't bring it over? Do you stop the process and back it up in Charlestown where the Charlestown neighbors should be just as concerned as we are? Um, 
what happens to, if we start creating methane, um, are we going to sit with that pump? I'm sure that Paul <coughs> is going to be on top of it, but what about any extra safety uh, safeguards that we have to need? And I'm gonna stop because I have, I could, I could go on for an hour, but just remember, we were here 30 years ago. My daughter was a baby, I'm very proud of her and all the work that she's done. But I've heard it before, and, and we were fortunate that under the leadership of Dick Fox that we built one of the best state-of-the-art facilities in the world. And it's because he listened to me and he listened to the people. And I hope that moving forward, you people will just take all of these questions and not just ignore them, but answer us and just incorporate it into your environmental studies. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. I appreciate what you're saying, and I think that through your hard work and hard work of, of many winter presidents, it came out pretty well. I mean, it came out pretty good, what, what's here. And, and that was through a lot of hard work and blood and sweat and from the folks in Winter and the members of the board of directors. And you do mention that the, we are probably the most regulated uh, cleanup and environmental organization that, that's ever come down the pike nationally, and the most studied uh, by every environmental regulatory agency that's out there. And all those permits you mentioned, we have to meet under this program. We cannot violate or go beyond or stretch or modify any of the permits or the requirements that are placed on us. And, and we have been, similarly, I, I hope you'll find some time, we have been working very closely with the Environmental Protection Agency on the federal end. Again, we spent, spent two hours with them the other day. They have people from every part of the regulatory process there listening to it, going over the information. DEP the same, the Secretary of Environmental uh, Affairs Office uh, is all over this. So whatever we do is going to have to meet the permit and is going to be under the full scrutiny of all those environmental regulators. And as you pointed out, they're not easy. I mean, the issue of the rodents in the garage is, is I mean, we could tell you some tales. Um, but, you know, in, 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 <laughs> as a part of the public. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, and, 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 and Chief Flanagan has, has been very, very diligent in keeping, um, well, to be, to be blunt, turning the screws to us to make sure that every term we're doing the right thing for the town. And, uh, you know, I, I, you can take some comfort in that, that, that he has pushed us as a staff, he's pushed the board, uh, and, and, and fought uh, very aggressively to make sure we end up in the right place. So, where we go, what, we, what arrangement we have with the town, whether we formalize it, whether it's informal, whatever it needs to be to move forward, we'll do it. But I thank you for your, your and I look forward to reading your letter. Other, other questions? Um, who goes there? Don, you want to defer today? Because you had a couple more, didn't you? Go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, you're talking about the uh, incremental cost impact, the MWA, 2.3 million to the bargain. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not even anywhere close to what it's going to be costing us. You, you never mentioned. Well, the final is going to be about five months. No, I don't. Well, if we go to the final, right? But uh, here's my point. You never mentioned <clears throat> additional legal costs, engineering and design costs, odor control studies, feasibility and many cost analysis studies, future construction of facilities for storage or other operations if applicable, interest costs on bonds, additional costs of materials from the slurry sent to Nut Island, a new gas distribution system design, a necessary CHP turbine facility to maximize the capture of the methane, studies for the different chemical effluents into the harbor, the increase of chemical purchases for the new expanded operations, higher insurance, electrical and safety costs, and on and on and on. By my, my estimate, the one turbine, CHP, is going to be $25 million. Now, that's right. That's right. So this is all on the ratepayers. So that's $25 million. And now the recommendation to the MWRA is for three of them. So I have these costs reaching $100 million if you go with the three turbines, which is being recommended. I mean, if you want to do it right, well, three, you have, three, maybe eight. Maybe eight. Well, let, me, let, me, let me finish. Let me finish. But the point is, we never get our money back. Ever. Mm -hmm. Well, we get our money back. And, you know, and, and what the MWR is trying to tell us is that, well, I, we can see $5 million a year savings, maybe up eight, 10, when it's, full, when it's full, fully running. $5 million a year, $2.5 million, million customers. 
That's too, you, do, you are doing all of this to, so that I can, as a right back, can save $2 a year. That's what it comes down to. I have $20, if you need them, I have $20, here's 20, and takes care of me for the next 10 years. This is so, I understand, and, and here's what's worse. And what's worse is this, for me, was the last one. The state is proposing an unrealistic schedule that runs against MWRA's thoughtful processes that have been developed over decades. That's what the state is forcing you to do things you don't even want to do and you never have done historically, and it's not right. And, and, and I'll tell you, for you to say to anybody here who says this is good savings for the, for the state, right, uh, for MDR ratepayers, don't ever say it. It's not true. We will never see, and not only that, it's not true because of this. Your own bondholders, your own bond rating companies require you to give rate, annual rate increases to your ratepayers around 3%. And if you don't do that, they're going to possibly reduce your, your bond rating. That's in your, the, the bond rating materials that I've read. So this thing of, oh, we'll get down to a, no, no increase, no rate. You're, you're, you're almost required to give us rate increases every year. And, and so the, 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 there's no savings here at all. It's just, for what I see, you have a perfectly run plant. And you're now you're going to be using up to eight digesters with four on the side, but you're by your own statements, Mr. Lassie, is the best way for this to, for the MWR to serve the community is to expand the community, the numbers of community who process their water treatment through, through Deer Island. More customers spread the debt out. That's what's been your uh, uh, your, by, your, your uh, point of view on this for many many years. So now we're not now you expanding with with organic materials being digested, where do all the other communities want to come in? And I think in the future, there's going to be a lot more that want to come. Well, I, that's I, know, I don't know where to start or where to finish. I know, no. <laughs> I got it up. That's it. You won't hear from me again. No, no, no. You raised, but you, you raised about 12 different points in the last and a half an hour. But first off, they're, 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 I don't, we don't foresee any, <coughs> any expansion of our service area in any significant way because of what Ms. Riley said about the, the, all of the the requirements placed on us, it would be very, very difficult. What you have discussed is, I would say the, the you have combined three different things that we have combined, and that is a long-term strategy on energy. The, one of the pieces of it is the co-digestion that, that we've been talking about. The second piece of it is that since the plant was built, there's been a desire from the operational folks you have a redundant gas line. The, ga the gas is made at the digesters way over there. It is used on the far end of the plant where it's, it's burned by the boilers. There's been, a desire, there's been a desire to have a second line so we can pull the first one down so we can maintain it if something goes wrong. You know, as the question was asked about if it got clogged with sewage, well, they had, the operational staff had the same concern about that gas line. So that's been on the boiler on the, in, the, in the pot about being done. The third thing that you mentioned is that we have uh, had a study done by a major engineering firm that looked at the way we make energy. And right now, the, the technology we use is 20 years old. And that basically, we make steam. The steam is used to heat the plant. Then that steam is run through turbines to make electricity, which is grossly inefficient. It, it's, it just, it's, it's a, what's it, 8%? 8 percent? 8 to 10 percent efficient. So the engineering firm has said, look at, you should really take a look at changing what is called your combined heat and power and change the paradigm with the new technology. Make electricity first, which is highly efficient, then the byproduct of making electricity is steam that you will heat the plant with, and you'll make a lot more energy and save a lot more money. So we're looking at three separate things that are all combined into one potential initiative. And that is the co-digestion, which would give us more digester gas. The second pipe that would get that gas and give us redundancy down in the far end of the plant. And then looking at changing out our boilers to the new technology. That, as you have pointed out, as always you do your homework, Mr. Osborne, um, is somewhere around $75 million or more, maybe $100 million. But 
when we look at, without any of the subsidies out there from the, the Green Fund and the Center for Energy this and the federal government, without any grant funding, if we were to do all three of those, the payback would be somewhere 10 to 12 years. 10 to 12 years. So that's not a bad payback without any subsidies. It's something we're looking at. And, and you know, the other thing that, that I, I should point out, and, and you know this better than anyone, our rates for the most part are driven by our debt. Over 60%, almost two thirds of your bill that your community gets from us is to pay off the mortgage on this plant on the $7 billion we've spent. So the amount of discretionary spending that goes on in the operational side is, is modest compared to our need to pay off the debt. And, and I will just assure you that we have a very aggressive strategy to pay that debt off in a responsible way so we can get get things down the other side. But anyway, I, I could spend an hour on that as well. Uh, John? Um, we have no the big old size trucks that are all over our sidewalks. Well, want to finish up the code digestion first because we have a whole section on trucks. Are there other questions on the code digestion? Because we can move on. Will there be more trucks coming through at this code digestion process and what's coming through the town now? Do we need more chemicals to make this process work? No, no. So will you use less chemicals? I mean, you're saying that this will help the digestion, so that would say you would use less chemicals? No. Uh, if anything, the, uh, the beneficial effect will be in the quality of the pellets. Uh, people, uh, other treatment plants that have used this co-digestion process uh, and implemented that have actually seen an improvement in the consistency and the quality of the material that goes into their, their fertilizer. Uh, it actually improves the quality of their fertilizer, so uh, we actually expect to see a benefit there. If there's no chemicals that we will add, to promote this digestion, but it's all it's all a natural organic. process. It's all natural. It's the same way. Will that be trucked in as well with the sodium hydroxide and all that? No. No. What? what? No. No. I'm sorry. No. no. I'm saying that there's another chemical. No. There's no, 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 there's no, no chemicals. No chemicals. No chemicals. It's all natural. The chemicals are used prior to the to the um, prior to the digesters. Well, or after the disinfection. Or when it, well, yeah, when it goes out in the outfall. That's when we hit it with the sodium hydroxide. Chemicals are used on the liquid. Right, not the solids. Yeah, so the, the, the simple answer is there'll be no increase in trucking because of the, the co digestion. Thank you. Know. Will there be increase? Uh, you're going to have to build another tunnel, correct? Or however you want to put it. No, the, the only, the, we're going to have to put a pipe under the ground. Pipeline, I'm sorry, I meant the pipeline. Ten inch so pipe if you're going to, are we going to have more construction? material coming through the town on trucks because of it? Minimal. There'll be a, a modest amount of 10-inch pipe that'll come in, uh, will be delivered by a vendor. Uh, in, in, if we get to the permanent plant and we have to build those two storage tanks, there'll be a minimum short-term number of trucks that might bring the materials in for that. But there'll be no ongoing increase in trucking. Yeah? Mr. Bowski, what's the mechanics of going from a pilot program to a Agreeable permanent program. Do we get notified? Do we vote on this? I can. Well, I, I assure you that you will clearly know. We'll have meetings and talk about it uh, and go through. But I, very frankly, I think that the the because we're barging it in, um, there'll be no difference to the town whether it's it, as far as any impacts in the town because it'll all be barged in. I don't even think you'll know the difference. Because the, the, you know, well, it depends on the studies or EPA studies or whatever. Right. But I mean, when it comes to the, right. it's of emissions, I don't understand the emissions. Is the emissions safe enough for us here at this co digestive yeah, process? We, we You're dealing are, with methane gas, it's explosive, well, we use, highly flammable. We use 99. 98% of the digester gas is utilized in our boilers, and the rating, remaining 2% is because uh, equipment may have to be down for maintenance, in which case we flare it. So, but it gets flared at about 2,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Is methane so. toxic? That, that no, methane, no. methane, raw methane is explosive. It's explosive, but it's like natural gas. Is right. there a byproduct that you're producing at the end of all this, like a pellet, did you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that pellet going to be for sale and you're selling that? Because I used to. Yeah, we, we sell a lot of pelletizers. Yeah, we sell by currently. We sell it currently? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. You can go to MWRA.com and actually get uh, information on base state organic. Is it all biomass? We'll give you yeah. some samples free if you want. Yeah. 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 It smells a little bit, I'll tell you. Yeah. 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 You want to put it down in the fall. Yeah. Yeah. You want to put it down in the fall when the wind doesn't blow. Yeah. Yeah. When you say short-term impact for construction of, right now we're talking about when this system is in place, what would its impact be? Most of us who live on the truck route have been, uh, shall we say, somewhat hoodwinked in the past by looking at the end product and not finding out till afterwards that short-term construction vehicles was months, years, on and off, heavy trucks shaking our houses, etc. So when you say short term to do the pilot thing, just 10 inch pipes going down the street, can you give me like a little clearer idea of what's going to pass my house? Yeah, I, I remember what happened. For the, for the pilot program, we're talking uh, 10 inch pipe. It's right. like this you know, 10 inch diameter pipe. Mm -hmm. So as we indicated, we'd be doing two buildings in the large area up to uh, the building over here on our right. We'll be using our own people. You know, we'll have to bring a backhoe in, we'll leave it here, we'll dig a trench from up there. So it's just the delivery of those, the 10 inch pipe. We have some uh, uh, smaller valves coming in, um, you know, uh, valves for a 10 inch pipe are about this big. Um, How long is, so do you see construction from your trench digging, pipe laying, valve putting in, etc.? We're, we're like, estimating the total construction duration would be approximately six months, but that's it's the total duration, not you know, total construction during that time period. So things yeah. like back hose and such things that you'd need, they'd make hopefully one traverse down Shirley Street, right. Taft's Ave, right. and not come back for six more months? Right. And, and I was saying really earlier, Alan, and it, well, as I said, the installation of the 10-inch pipes, there's two of them side by side. We're doing with our own, we have our own pipeline crews. Um, and there might be five, five to ten trucks bringing the pipes and the valves in. It's not, a, it's not a big project compared to some of the other things we do. Okay, just check. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's the pilot program. That's what we're discussing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you will. Sure. Um, on this, with the product being treated into the sewage and everything, does, is that going to help the smells, or is it going to make the smells worse? Is there a thing in the plant for us to keep a watch on that, and even maybe a hotline for people residents to call? Yeah. We do have an owner hotline. We do have an order hotline that, that you know, we get there for a call a month or so. But no, there'd be no change in the, the you know, it's all within facilities that are under the order control now. Right. And it's for the most part when you for the most part if you have an order, it's because we have something down for maintenance or work. You know, when the big plant is running, for the most part, you know, you don't get that earthy smell. The order we have tonight from the yeah. human? Yeah. 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 So anyone from the third Thank you. Thanks. Okay, what? Oh, done. Uh, just to put a familiar face. Regards to the uh, pier, is there any chance that once you're done with the, uh, the refit, which I was pleasantly surprised by the product, is there any chance that that will be used to replace some of the trucks that are being driven through town with barges or some other method? It's unlikely. It really didn't work. Well, um, and, and you know, it just didn't it didn't work out. We thought we could barge some stuff in, and it just didn't it didn't work out with the vendors, and we didn't get any bids, and the prices were so astronomically high that it was it, been, it was almost scandalous what we were paying. So it just didn't work out. The, the, the economics of it didn't work out. So I don't want to you know tell you oh we'll look at it because it really it, our experience was very bad. But the economics of repairing the road damage that's being caused mm -hmm. is far outweighing what you could be bringing over this stuff by barge. You could, even if you have to build storage facilities, there's plenty of room on the island, build some big tanks, put all your sodium hypochloride in there, bring it over once or twice a month from a barge, and it's done. The same as, you know, it's better than running the trucks through the town. It's a safety issue. It's a, it's a, look at the streets in this town, I ship. I mean, how are we going to pay to repair all these streets, all this damage? 
not just the, to the streets, but the property damage, the curbing, I mean, you name it, the trees, everything that's being mowed down. And it's not whether it's just by these, these trucks, it's all the other trucks as well. And when this program began before, everything was barged over. It was in the mitigation agreement, all the construction equipment and everything. And that worked out pretty well. So I think that you can get some bids in on it. I think you should at least try. Something needs to be resolved to either end all this trucking throughout the town mm -hmm. and, and use that beautiful pain you guys got. I mean, I really think you should take another look at it. Maybe it didn't work before, but, but what, and that was then. We, we just, to go back in time, and I know that uh, way back, way back in the day, I know there was, when we were using chlorine, we, were, we, were, we converted everything to hypochlorite. We had storage tanks, and we used to barge in the hypochlorite. Mm -hmm. I, remember the, I remember the first delivery to Deer Island of hypochlorite via barge. Yeah. It worked well. It worked well for over probably 10 years. And as it got, as we, we were actually using less and less of it, because we didn't need as much, what had happened is the manufacturer began saying, okay, the price continues to go up because the barge needs maintenance, the barge needs maintenance. The barge. Now, we didn't own the barge, they did. So eventually it got to the point where it wasn't cost effective. And we actually went out to bid to get some competition for other barges. Boarding, uh, Boarding Remington was going to build a plant down in New Bedford. We were getting it from Keeney Chemical out of New Jersey, and they were barging up, and it was working well. And if we continue to get, if we continue at this point to get good, reasonable bid prices, we'd still be using it. The price, the, the price of hydrochloride is right now we're paying about 50 cents. They wanted to charge us 90 cents a gallon. It just was not economically feasible for us to continue that. And what had happened is Keeney eventually went out of business. They didn't go out of business. What they did is they got rid of the barge. There is no one to barge hypochlorite to us even if, even if we accepted a 90 cent bid. There's no, they, no longer, they no longer barge hypochlorite. There's no one who does that in the, on, the, on the East Coast. So we've looked at all these avenues. John, is there a reason that they don't do it now? Because, yeah, because it's not, it's not cost effective for them. Because there's no one else who uses it in the, in, the, in the quantities that, and we don't even use it in the quantities that they would supply it. And that's what happened. We were using less and less and less. When we first began building the plant and designing it, we were <coughs> anticipating using uh, uh, probably more than, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm making these numbers up, 50,000 50, gallons a day. Well, we'll only end up using 10. And, we, and because of the treatment process in making this system operate as well as it does today. Well, over the last 20 or 30 years, I've seen a steadily increasing amount of trucks. All hours of the day and night, sometimes two, three trucks a day, loaded with so sodium over the client. So are you saying you're using less now than you were back then, or are you using more? No, we're, we're using less as compared at when we first started. And we'll go over the truck traffic. We have a chat, and I'd love to go over that and share with you some of some of those numbers. All right, why don't we? Okay, I'm just saying that. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know that you said it was not cost effective. But what's not cost effective is to us townspeople in Windsor, with our roads getting destroyed, and we don't get enough money to repair them. Exactly. On top of me, I live right on Elliott Street, which I have every single truck that comes by me. They hit my curb every two in the morning. Which I, I'll, I wake up, I hear it in my phone room. No one's thinking of that stuff. On top of when you're coming up taps and hear the big truck coming down that side, because he's seeing he can't come down Elliot, and he has no detail. And then, not to mention the fire engines at quarter past five in the morning flying down here. I know it's cost effective, but what about us? That's what people keep well, I think I do request the quality is that of if they're coming in at 2 a.m., you need to report that to us. And you can report it via the order hotline because none of the contractors should be coming in before 6 a.m. We have it in the, uh, uh, in the requirement of every bid that we put up. We know they get lost. That, they do. that does that's, happen. That's, that's what happen. does happen. It does happen. It does happen. But, but if you report it, we take care of it. Don actually uh, complained about one uh, contractor that blew through a stop sign right there. We're doing we re our own we reported, surveillance. We reported to the uh, uh, trucking company. They actually fired that long-standing employee from their uh, force. That, uh, that guy is no longer employed by the company that uh, is there. So if you report it to us, we will act on it. 
We are trying to be responsive as much as possible to any any comments or complaints that you guys make. Yes. If Chili Street becomes flooded or we have more problems with global warming and our waters are rising, what's your plan B if you can't use Shirley Street? Well, you can take your time. That, <laughs> no, thankfully, thankfully the, the, the people who designed this plant understood the potential of global warming and built it higher than it needed to be. So it built those massive armored sea walls out on the ocean side. So of all our assets, even though it's the one that sticks farther out, farthest out in the ocean, uh, this is the, the, the facility that's probably going to withstand any kind of massive Hurricane Sandy or whatever it may be. Not the facility. I'm talking about Shirley Street where Yellow Beach is. Yeah. That, mean, little, that little, you know, that little sandbar, that little piece of land that's there. We, the yeah, buses, and we're, and we're the the buses can't here. pass through. Folks in the room down here, we'll, we'll head out it's, front end, go to help and go out and open up the road after the big storms come through. You know, that's I mean, let's say storm of 78. They had, this, they, they had the, the no name storm moving down. No, it, it, it has happened. Yes, ma'am. It know, has happened. You know what's really crazy? It's that the slurry is non toxic and it's going to be barged. The toxic stuff is being trucked. Too bad we can't reverse that. Well, well, well. So we understand. We need to look at it. Huh? Uh, part, part of it is also quantity. The material that we'd be receiving is actually in much larger quantities. Uh, the chemicals that we receive, uh, if, you, if you look at some of the numbers that are on the chart for uh, traffic, the lower bar, uh, the, the lower segment of each of these mm -hmm. is, is chemical trucks, mm -hmm. uh, and those are uh, total number of trucks per week. We oh, average month. about a month. Uh, month, sorry, thank you. Uh, we average about three chemical trucks a day. So, and we have been for a long period of time. Uh, it does have a seasonal difference. You might see some days that might have a few more trucks and then a few that might have a, uh, less trucks. Uh, there could be days that we don't have any trucks uh, from a chemical perspective. But the, there's other support trucks, box trucks, other things like that that will still come into the facility. We still have to get other general supplies. Mm -hmm. Unless there's something extraordinary, they don't come in on the weekends or the holidays. Correct. This is yeah. just snowstorm. Yeah. Yeah. Typ typically, trucks are Monday to Friday only. We, we write it into the contract. Unless there's an extreme event, uh, like a hurricane or something like that, that restricts us from uh, gaining access from three or four days, in which case we might have to prearrange, in, in which case we will notify one for fire and police that we're receiving trucks on a, on a weekend day. Uh, in advance of, uh, of doing that. I'm just saying that Shirley Street and Yarrow Beach is very fragile. It really is. And I'm just, I'm just concerned because I live at the end of the island, one street away from you guys. And I see what goes on a lot more than you do because I'm here all the time. Right. So it's just, it's just such a fragile little piece of street. And so much activity is going on on that little piece of street. And I was just curious if it was a fire there recently, the last year or so, but they blocked, we couldn't go to work because of this. And I was wondering, what do you do for plan B? We, we are, we're very, very envious of our colleagues on the west coast called East Bay Mud, which has its own entrance and exit off the interstate, solely for them. We would like nothing better, but we don't. We didn't, we didn't in a sense, we didn't make the decision in 1885 to put the treatment plant out here. Could you make a pipeline and, for your toxic stuff? And, and so we, we work hard, we try to do our best. It, you know, it, is it frustrating to have trucks go by your house? Yes, it does. It is. I lived on a street that had a lot of trucks before we moved to this house, and it can get frustrating. We understand that we're trying to make the best of it. I think I'm more concerned with you guys as businessmen, what your plan B is, because as a business, you'd want to have something that you can rely on. And I don't know if Shirley Street's always going to be reliable for you guys. Yeah. And so I'm worried about myself as well as you. Yeah, look what the town did to us on the 4th of July. Dug up the whole damn street there. What is it? Nobody could get in or out. We had to go down around the ocean. And everything was blocked off. You couldn't get out. You had to go all the way to Revere to come back in again. Mm -hmm. Now, 4th of July, biggest weekend of the year here. And they shaft us. Three weeks they dug up the street, so they had to go all in the curbs and everything. Anybody that does curb work or anything, always put a, a lip around the curb so you could drive over. This contractor never did any of that. People were blowing tires and everything else. 
going all over, all that stuff. On the 4th of July, the biggest thing down here is that. We got no satisfaction whatsoever. They shafted us. Your trucks could have a lot of trouble with it as well. <laughs> All right, well, there was no need of that. Okay. Here, I don't know if you can see, I mean, we got people that care and people that don't care. Well, we try, and, and you know, it's hard. It's hard. We have vendors. We have, you know, once our employees leave here, they're on their own. We do our best with them. Is it perfect? No. You know, we have people who roll through a stop sign. Yeah, we do. I watched the whole video. And that's when some, something will seriously be done about it. I believe the trucking is the key. If you, you know, you want to be good neighbors, you find a box, find a way, find a pipeline, find some way to get the chemicals here that's least intrusive. And if you're going to be you know, if there's more of a danger on it, maybe the time has come to build a fire station on the island that has the hazmat that will deal directly with it. So that not, we're not dealing with fire trucks flying down the streets at you know, all hours of the day and night when you've got something on the island. If something happens down here with a catastrophic methane gas, at least you'll have a, a company down here to deal with it as it's happening. And maybe even they can help Winthrop uh, with, without, without a fire zone like that. But you've got that one causeway on and off of that island. And anything can stop it. As this storm tonight, it could be, you know, if this was a nor'easter to block the roads and stuff, how do you get your chemicals in? How do you get your emergency vehicles in? How do you get them out? How do you get, if someone has a heart attack, how do you get an ambulance in and get it out? These are all the things that really affect us the most. And that's what needs to be addressed. I mean, I'm all for this code digestion thing, Any, uh, the new technology, all that. I think it can be done. You can probably save money, like I said, 10 years out of things for itself. But it's all the other stuff that we have to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what we need to address. The trucking is destroying our community. It really is. I mean, the quality of life. Forget the, the jets. Forget everything else that we have to deal with. But with just the trucks alone, and like you said, they're not supposed to do this, they're not supposed to do that, but they do it. We don't know the reasons. We don't care. We just know that. It's, it's really crippling the way that you know, our, our community is being destroyed by this. And we really want to like, sit down with you guys and come up with a plan. What are you gonna, maybe you're going to pipe the chemicals in there, like you do from Nun Island. You bring it over there, truck the stuff over to Nun Island, and then run, run it through the pipeline you hear. But it seems to be that there's got to be another way to do this. If you can't barge it, pipe it. Mm -hmm. But it seems that there's just more and more chemicals right being airport. used. That's plan B. That would be plan B. But in an emergency, it makes perfect sense, too. You don't have to worry about the weather. You've got a pipeline. You've got pipelines in existence right now from the island here. Something to think about. Maybe something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. On the safety issue regarding the trucks, compared to the chlorine trucks that we knew 30 years ago and the HCL trucks now, my first question is what are the impacts in the case of? a rollover, a leak, or whatever, to HCL. Is it different than chlorine? A lot different? Same hazards? What? I, I think you mean sodium hypochlorite, which is mm -hmm. NaOCL. -N -A yeah. well, so it's not, HCL is hydrochloric acid. Yeah. And we, don't have, we don't have that on, on site. Yeah. So, no, so well, my question is, those trucks with the chemicals now going through, what are, their, what are the hazards in the case of a puncture, a rollover, an accident, whatever, to us, to the neighbors? I can tell you one of the things that we do uh, do on an annual basis. We work with both Winthrop and Boston Fire. We train them annually. Uh, we bring them on site. We uh, go through a list of all the chemicals on the, on the site, all the hazards associated with all of the, the chemicals, the locations that they're stored, uh, the uh, response that you would typically have if there was a release to the environment. And then we work with them uh, on developing uh, future plans for if something does happen in the community. What are, I'm asking directly, what are the hazards to me as a resident if one of those trucks rolls over in front of my house? I'm I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try. Yep. I'll try. The chlorine trucks that used to be delivered here 30 years ago came in liquid form. 
Mm -hmm. If it were ever punctured, you would have a chlorine gas cloud okay. around what, and that was obviously some one of the many reasons we, we went to hypochlorite. Okay. Hypochlorite, if it is ruptured or tips over, it is a liquid form. If it, let's assume it's in the street. I've worked with Mr. Uh, Chief Flanagan and, and, and Chief Powers before him about how we would handle a spill of that nature. Mm -hmm. Most cases, you can wash it down with water. You'll have a strong odor, but it will not. It will not harm you or the persons living in your home. Like in it's, not, it's, not gonna, it's not a gas. You're not going to turn into a, a huge gas cloud. Okay. There will be a strong smell of bleach. Understand, there will be a strong smell of bleach. It will be unpleasant, but it certainly will not harm or kill anyone in the neighborhood. It won't okay. be a gas cloud. Okay. That's, that's guaranteed. But we will. There will be a cleanup associated with it. The chief, and I know that I've worked with the chief and the chief powers before him about how we clean up hypochlorite if there ever was one. The other thing I'd like to add is the trucks that are coming down here are double contained. Very, we haven't had an accident, thank God, knock on wood, with, with a hypochlorite truck or any of the big tankers that come down here. And that's, I think, one, one of the reasons, you know, one of the, one of the good things about the trucking industry is they are monitored, highly monitored, and regulated. That was my second question. Um, not related to your um, organization, but related to the work on Shore Drive here. A lot of us were extremely astounded, horrified, when one of the trucks carrying the sand and the rocks went over at the Lynn Marsh Road rear rotary. Uh, big sand thing just flipped over, which those of us who have run into the trucks at the rotary didn't shock us that it turned over. Mm -hmm. What did shock us was the after report from the state police of the incredible safety violations involved in that truck, its cab, its brake linings, its this, its that. I was curious as the daughter of someone who used to inspect trucks for Liberty Mutual, how often are the trucks carrying chemicals safety inspected as in their, their upkeep, their normal maintenance um, obviously, hopefully, they have good driving records, but I'm talking the vehicle itself because that's we were horrified. That's a great. fair question, and, and, and quite frankly, uh, I could not answer that at this moment. But I can surely find out for you. I would like to. Please. I can surely find out for you. I know that the, I know that the uh, the the, comp the companies that we use, Jones Chemical and, and the like, are highly regulated. I can get that information, but I would be I would be guessing if I knew what their maintenance were. Right. I'd like to know how often they're looked at. Yep. For the I think that's, those a, fair, that's a fair that's question. Well, if you, and we will get your name and we'll make sure that I get that information to you. Okay, thank you. Just, just I would add, uh, add a response to that. The state police truck team has jurisdiction all the way up and down Massachusetts, and those are, are optional stops for that truck team. Um, they've been concentrating up in the North Shore area uh, since that accident and inspecting the sand trucks um, quite vigorously. So not only has it is the industry responsible, but also state police truck team stops these trucks at the end of the year and as many times as they want during that year. For, for, for any chemicals or just for? For any truck traveling yeah. across Massachusetts. Well, obviously they didn't do too well at the rotary then, did they? Well, it's, again, you, you have one truck out of how many trucks are That's traveling. That's what I'm saying. I don't think so, it should be random in the case of chemicals. Well, no, but they, 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 the way. industry will have their own standard. But they're talking, again, a state police truck team can stop at any time on any roadway in right. Massachusetts to do additional inspections. I think I'd want one from the company. Thank you. Thank you. Could, can I ask you to go back to the last slide on the number of trucks? Sure. You had a, can you go back? And then you started talking about the, the red on the bottom, the number of uh, trucks or chemicals. Can you just sort of tell me, because I know the people in this area know, because um, they live with it daily, but I live on the other side of town. Can you, can you tell me? What the red and the orange are, but type the trucks what they carry. We can't read the bottom. Oh, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. The red and here is the box. Our chemical trucks, and that's all the chemicals that Deer Island receives on, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Uh, there's a the green that's in here, uh, and uh, that's fuel oil. Uh, so uh, twice a year, we typically receive a fuel oil delivery uh, via truckload, and all of those uh, trucks come in convoys. Uh, and uh, that are police escorted. And by the way, because of the low prices, we're going to be buying fuel if you haven't already. So we're going to sometime in the next couple of weeks have some convoys, police escorted in, 
uh, to bring the fuel in. And you can see that's periodic, as you can see the green there. Yeah. Uh, the next bar is uh, purple, and that's uh, uh, trucks that are heading towards the warehouse, and those are typical supplies. <laughs> they could be gloves, they could be safety supplies, they could be uh, bolt, you know, nuts, bolts, whatever, uh, tools. Most of those are small box trucks. Yeah, mostly box trucks. Most of those are small, like delivery trucks, vans, those types of things. The next, Mason. the next bar is uh, blue, and uh, that's actually uh, trucks associated with contractor work. So uh, Deer Island is aging, uh, so we have uh, certain contracts that we put out uh, to repair different parts of the facility, bring it uh, up to code. Uh, replace uh, other uh, parts of the facility where uh, equipment has worn out it's, uh, beyond its useful life. So we have to replace that. So that will be very cyclical in nature depending on uh, the nature of the work that's being done. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's an other category and that's uh, they don't clearly fit into a contractor or warehouse. Uh, they could be other support type vehicles, uh, whatever. That For instance, like the, vet, the vendor who delivers food to the vending machines and those type of trucks are counted as others. So we track all of our trucks. Yeah. So if I can see a couple of follow-ups. So if I'm reading the chat right, it looks like at no point during any of those months is the, the chemicals exceed, say, 20% of your truck deliveries. Is that a fair read? Uh, yeah, probably. probably. With math, yes. Yeah, I mean, just well, to, yep, I guess, yep. Yep. So I, I guess the question is, if the chemicals are a big concern to the residents out here, um, and the, I can say this as a former town official, I couldn't say it if I was still wearing the hat, in the, uh, the mitigation agreement is coming up with the town, why could not you explore the idea of a pipeline for your chemicals, and as a result of taking those trucks off the street, reducing the mitigation package to pay for the cost of the pipeline debt? So that way the residents would feel like, obviously as a town official I'd be screaming and yelling, but if if, I, if you said we're going to take 200 grand a year out of your mitigation package when it comes up for renewal, and we're going to put that towards a debt service on a bond and we're going to borrow money solely to build a pipeline where 100% of our chemicals will now come into the plant through, through, uh, through a pipeline. Mm -hmm. So the residents out here would have no concern at all about chemicals. They still would live with the overwhelming majority of the trucks. The 80 percent, but at least they can sleep well knowing that there are no chemicals. Period. Yeah, I mean, the question is, does the, the, the economics work? You know, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. We can at least look into that. So we can look at the finances. Sure, sure. I mean, I don't know what a pipeline costs, and I don't know what the debt service. So it might, it might not be economical. The <coughs> is also you have to look at the volume of the pipe and what's the distance it has to travel. Or barging, what was so, the added cost? Right. You know, those types of things. You know, there are some chemicals that we might only buy 100,000 gallons over a course of an entire year in a pipeline. Uh, just to give an example, the pipeline that runs between us and the pellet plant, that's actually 360,000 gallons just for the pipeline itself. So, uh, but we'll look at it. So, okay. you can reduce Thanks. the size of the pipe and do other things. Thanks. Uh, another part of the question I had earlier, uh, this part that you plan on using, who owns it? It'll be owned by waste management. Or, or leased by waste management. Or leased waste. by waste management. Okay, I'd like to get into the sir. Sir, you might look all right, but it's Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Right? Is there any other uh, news you want to tell us? Uh, yes, there is, if you like, yeah. Can we go to the pier? Yeah. yeah we've been approached by the, the... Excuse me one moment. You sure. put up signage. Yes. There was oh, yeah, a, yeah. a new sign that was related to tw a, a, a speed limit of 20. Yeah. On the way in tonight to this meeting, thank you, there was a white, uh, small truck and definitely was not doing 20 speed out. Believe me, he flew. Did it have the yellow lights and the sticker on it? Had me? Did it have the yellow lights and the roof I, and the sticker? I didn't see. It was a white truck. Okay. A small white truck, but he flew. <laughs> it also goes down Fast <coughs> Avenue the wrong way. Unfortunately, I, I saw him. He started to go around and I guess changed his mind. This was like a week and a half, two weeks ago. And he just decided, I don't know if he works here or not. But he just decided, oh, he could go the wrong way down Taft's yeah. and God forbid if somebody had been in his way. And uh, it, it's funny that you should say that, the white 
the truck. It's unusual. I, again, as, as I stated earlier, if you can get the license plate and report that to me, I, we will listen. Unfortunately, I'm going to If it is an FWR employee. We were close with Chief Del mm -hmm. on, on this stuff and, you know, crosswalks. We put the radar thing up. Whatever you need, we, you know, if you, we want to be good neighbors on this stuff. We, you know what really happened? The camera, right in the intersection of Taft, Elliot, and Elliot. And the reason why a camera, similar, okay, to the one, similar to the one that you use, that they use out at the landing, with an eyeball that the police and so forth can see. Now maybe they can't write tickets with it, it's not been, been told. Yeah, but it's just the that. idea that if something does happen, you'll have footage of it. Running the stop signs, speeding, all that. And that would be either from the employees here or even from the residents who live down here. But it's funny that the rest of the town has surveillance, except for the point. And why don't we have a camera down here? Now, the, video that, the video that's on YouTube. Which uh, one? <laughs> well, the, the most recent one. The most recent one. I think, I think, that was Friday. I think the re equal opportunity uh, for not only our employees, but residents, and yes. including the town school bus to roll right through without touching the right. grass. I have, I have no favorites. You know, I have so to say. And, and if you want to, you know, anyway. We, anyway, let's talk about it. All right, we, we, have been, we have been approached by the Mass Department of Fish and Game. Um, and, and you may know that they have recently, within the last several years, implemented a saltwater um, fishing license. And as part of the requirement of that license is a fee collected, and they need, they are required to take that fee money and build fishing piers or public access piers <coughs> at different locations around the state. Mm -hmm. And they have come to us after scouting out around Boston Harbor and said, hey, we would love to build a fishing pier on the arrival. And these are examples of two of the piers they built, one at Oak Bluffs and one in Yarmouth, and um, build a pier for the folks of, you know, for Deer Island. Why don't we go to the next one? Mm -hmm. yeah. And they have proposed this location, and this is the Mazzoni. Um, oh, no, here it is. Oh, yeah. This is the, with the, the phone cables and all that. Here's the public access parking. And we have, we've expressed interest in at least fleshing out the idea and see what it's about. And one of the things that they have put on the table is that as part of this, they would either build a small or cost share on a larger project for an increased parking. And so we have sketched out, see where it says parking, to put the idea of an extra parking lot, perhaps seasonal in nature for the warm weather, um, that would complement the pier. And then the one of the things I hear a lot, besides the trucks and frying number two on the, the hit parade, is the, the problem with parking because the public access is overfilled. And they park down Taft Avenue, they block the bus, uh, the, you know, they, they're just all up and down the neighborhood. And, and frankly, it's it's a very popular place that seems to be growing in popularity. So the, the idea was first off would be a nice fishing pier. Uh, we always we have a ton of fishermen already, who I think would probably rather than walk way down the island would just stay here and fish. But we would have the potential of picking up uh, some added parking spaces as part of this project. Would it be just for winter residents? No, we can't no. do that. No. Why? Can't do that. Can't pass down it's state funded. State it's state funded. funded. But you know, again, I don't know what the percentage of folks who walk around. Um, the, the, the island now, but the vast majority went through just because of difficulty of getting there. You might pick up some people from a beer or, or whatever, but I don't think people are going to drive a long way to come just for the pier. They do. So um, typically, uh, I know at least in Winthrop and pretty much everywhere, including all of Boston, Outer Islands, they close at dusk. Yes. Deer Island does not. Deer Island does not have any policing whatsoever at any time whatsoever, whether it's one cup or the state police. And you can walk out there at midnight and find people fishing with no permits, no no anything. Anything goes on in the middle of the night. And you might watch it from your surveillance cameras or up there, and you guys have no idea what goes on. So now you 
which I love the pair. I want to be the first one to jump off of it at high tide when it's built. Okay? We got that on camera because I'm back there. But, but the point is, you leave it open 24 hours a day, and you don't deal with the people that go through our cars, that break into our yards, mm -hmm. that drive <coughs> the animals down the stretch at 2 in the morning. And the motorcycles. It, it's uh, it's just everything. So are you going to lock it finally, or are you going to leave it open for everybody? Because all the harbor islands, first of all, you can't just get on them whenever you want, or at least you're not supposed to. And even all the parks in Winthrop say they grow that dust. This, this does not happen here. This is no full fog. Come to Winthrop, come to Deer Island, Winter ask Park. any of them. All right, but let, but let me say this. What, we have the exact same situation in Nut Island. We have a, the park there, part of the island, the National Park, and we have a fishing pier there, and we have, it's a very popular place, particularly in the warm weather. And it, sometimes they come in, you know, there's people hanging out in the grass, in the breeze, throwing the water, whatever it might be, and, and when they close the gate, because the neighbor said, oh, this is too busy, everyone just parked down in the neighborhood. And so instead of having them all parked on our facility, they all parked up the street. And, and so it became a nightmare for the neighborhood because people wanted to come there on a hot night, and they did. So we could explore the possibility of closing it down, it's, but I'm telling you, we'll be back here. It's very easy. It's two words. It's called accountability and security. Right. But I'm just telling you, we could, we could talk about closing it down. I guarantee you, we close it down. They're going to be all the way down Taft Avenue. They're going to be the first street to the left. And they're going to but not if you have security patrolling the area or the state police like it's supposed to be. And I believe that was somewhere in what Mrs. Rather well, called the MOUs. Well, you can shut the water is out. extremely deep. I mean, we love it. We want it. It's beautiful. It looks great. It still doesn't have help what goes on in the middle of the night when nobody is policing your island. It's not our island, it's Boston's island. I, I, know that the, I know that the people who go fishing, either they put their kayaks in and go off in the kayaks, or they walk way down the end of the island. So I don't think it's the fishermen that are the problem, right? from what I can see. Now, my, my dear, their cars coming and going, I'm not going to argue that. But the fishermen, for the most part, aren't, aren't the issue. And, and you know, we pulled the police records for the night to see, you know, what what goes on there. Because people say, oh, you don't know what's going on down there. And and there are some issues that arise here and there. Um, but it's not considered a high crime anymore. What's the minimum wage in the state? Can you pay somebody that an hour? Is that cost effective enough for you? How about the needles that uh, they find all over the ground out there? I mean, it's, it's nine bucks an hour, cost effective. It doesn't have to be hard. I, I, I fish down on the island. I love it. I enjoy it. I've been down there at 10 o'clock fishing, too. <coughs> so I welcome it. But what she's talking about on the security, and when I'm down there, sometimes I see families down there with kids playing, some fish and everything. Yeah. But at the same time, all this no security brings a lot of riffraff. There's guys I go down there. I'm the one with a cotton, I got fishing things coming out, I bring a trash bag, I go down there, I go on your dock, I use it, thank you. But the people leave trash, people leave beer cans, and, people, and I actually pick wherever I, where I go, I pick up any, my trash and any trash around me, and bring it back with me. So there's a lot of potential to put a lot of happiness here, but this also brings people from outside of winter, which I have no problem with that, but they need their own messes. A lot of people come down here because they don't, I have a fishing license. I went on and paid my dues. I believe in that. It yeah. helps, the, helps them clean up everything. I mean, what we, what we can do is we can talk to, we have a security contractor here who's hired some very, very responsible people. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what we can do is, sorry, well, let me do this. Because we do have, we do have people who, we have a security staff, we have people who, uh, the contractor, we can talk about them adding to the rounds coming down to public access, sitting there with yellow lights on, you know, showing people away, those kinds of things on a regular basis. See, that's very reason. It doesn't belong to us. Our police can't go out there and serve. That's right, it's a state police. It has to be a private We have, a, we have been conversations 
frankly, since you and I spoke on your front porch about the, the, the police coming down more frequently, riding through, they supposedly put that on their route to come down and, and do the loop. Now, wait, we call. We usually do get a nightly visit. Yeah, so they're coming down a couple it's times a day. It's just one nightly visit. And, but it is a jurisdictional issue. I mean, it is the state police. Yeah. They fiercely defend it. You know, they don't want to give it up. And, and so there is a little bit of awkwardness because we're sitting in Boston right now. Greg, one issue though, the fish made the, the police chief and I are down the island four or five nights a week. Uh, Undercover? <laughs> I bring him for protection. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a few times I've called you up early in the morning, Fred, vandalism last night down the yep. island, it's gone the next day. My opinion is, with the fishermen on the island, and we talk about trash left behind, it's only there till the next day it gets cleaned up. If those fishermen aren't on Deer Island property, they're going to, they're going to fish. Yep. They're going to Euro Beach, and it's not getting picked up the next day. The only good thing is, under the MWRA watch, that trash is getting picked up the next well, day. Well, I agree with the they it's still wrong for them to pick up other people's trash. It's true. It comes but down it to down. having security and creating ownership to people, having respect to people where they, well, they don't. Hey, can I, can I, can I offer, or give away your picture? Um, that's extremely deep waters right there where they're, you're indicating yeah. the pier. Uh, roughly, have they suggested or have you talked about how long that would take and the pilings that would be involved and the trucking? to bring in that, to build that I don't know whether they're bringing in trucks or bringing in a barge. I'm not sure. we, this is a conceptual discussion, right? That's all at this point. We don't know the details. But it would be short-term construction. It might seems be like anything that starts off in winter preliminary somehow becomes a yeah. bed yeah. <laughs> Sir, is that what fishermen would like appear to be? Oh, well, like one on the other side. There, well, the, the other side is too rough. Yeah. If you put it on the ocean side, it'd be ripped yeah, off and destroyed. Tonight, it'd be destroyed. Yeah. So they went around and surveyed at the elevations and whatever. They're the experts, not us. But if I could, can I? Uh, is it the sense of the group that you like the concept of the pier, but you want us to deal with the security issues before we move forward? Is and that the building it? process. Yes. Yeah, that was okay. one of the things. I've spoken to some of the fishermen down there, and I asked them, says, how come you don't go down to Castle Island and fish? And he said, well, because they have police down there, and they check to see who have permits. You don't need a permit to go fishing down here. So in other words, fine, they can all have the permits. You have, no one's going to be there to enforce who's there checking permits. They're just going to come down, and they're going to take advantage of our of this. Fred, if I could just add to that, what, well, let's engage the environmental police to work with us um, on this project and on the fishing issues themselves. Um, we have a decent relationship with the environmental police at the landing and at other areas of town, so let's see if we can bring them in occasionally um, to spot check the licenses down Deer Island and bring some enforcement to that issue. Um, I think that would be helpful. And I think you know the concept is a good concept, but the parking is a major issue, major focus point of complaints for me on duty and off duty wherever I go. It's parking on Taft Avenue, so parking on Maryland, it's parking. And when I come down, quite frankly, um, you know, parking is full. Yeah. And it's a seasonal problem, as you said. We come yeah. down and go down there tonight, it's not a problem. So that is an issue. And I again, walk it tonight, I no, <laughs> not tonight. I'm going to skip tonight. I'm going to get it too long. Um, but also, I just want to thank you because you were very responsive to uh, putting some um, arrows down on the ground and do not enter signs in the public parking lot. After I, um, I called uh, Chief Flanagan or, and I called Nick uh, Damani, and uh, that was very beautiful. Within three days, the signs were up. And that helped with the flow of traffic, people cutting in, trying to steal spots and crossing chaos in that parking lot. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Who enforces the parking down there now? Who's, who's here? Yeah, technically, the state police, because it's over the city line. So, it's over the town line. And the question is there's no sign on that causeway that says this is worth it, this is Boston. You can get one put in. We have to get one of those entry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because because if, if they are illegally parking on the winter side, you know, then we can do something about it. Otherwise, we have to call the state police. Right, right, right. Fred, right. I request the DBW has marked on the winter blind. There's a sore cover uh, that says the town of Winthrop and a little seal. Oh, no. They also marked it with a white spray paint line, so the officers on patrol knows where the winter blind is. With, with the state police line begins. And that was done over the summer as well. So right. just yeah, yeah. We, we run into, people howling because the state police came down and told everyone, well, 
It turned out because they had parked the, the Paul Revere bus couldn't make the loop, right? They were stuck, so they had to come down. And, so it, we'll work on the security side of it. Yeah, because we're just worried that that's going to add more with that parking lot down there. You're going to be adding more traffic going in and out. This is just a suggestion, but you go to the hand. In the hunt. Yeah. The hunt's very similar to Point Shirley in Deer Island. Nobody can park in the hunt unless you have a parking permit. That's right. And if you want to spend the day at the beach in the hunt, you have to go to the local police station and buy a permit for five dollars for the day. That's right. And I think they've even eliminated that now. So now you need just a permit. You leave that open to anybody, we're gonna have just more traffic coming in. So there's nothing wrong with putting a five dollar fee on parking. There's nothing wrong with it. From the town or the state or anybody. Well, to donate that to us. It's, it's, <laughs> I mean, $5, they do it up the land, you can launch a boat. What's wrong with $5 to park? What? It regulates. You know, it gives you some water. It doesn't let it be willy nilly out there that anybody can come and stay there all night. What if they want to stay all night? They do. They do. Some of the fish the whole night, I think. I think some, some of the fish the whole night. Yeah. No, some people take tents and put them up on the hill and sleep there with their family. Really? You see? Yes. I'm going to take some pictures. Yeah, please. I will. Because of it. I'll be on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 No, oh, I thought you were right here. No, no. Well, listen, I, I thank you all for coming and, and being patient, and, and we've taken a lot of notes and understand it, and we'll try to be responsive to everything you've asked. And I would like to get the sense, we do this perhaps in March, get through the holidays in the winter, and before the, the summer kicks off.